Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Oldfield here with you. And this is a radio program brought to you by the Church of Christ. We meet at 250 Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina, and we hope that you will come out and visit with us anytime you have the chance. We meet on Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, and five, uh, Thursday nights at at uh, 7 p.m. I started to say 5 p.m. on Sunday nights, but 5 p.m. on Sunday afternoons is when this program comes on. So I hope that you will tune into that. And again, we meet at 250 Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. I hope that you will come out and visit with us, friends. The, your friends in the Church of Christ are the folks that want to study the Bible. And we'll give you a Bible answer for what we believe and why we believe it. And uh, yeah, there, we'll, we'll answer questions that your preacher won't answer. I can assure you that. And so we hope that you will come out and visit with us. If you're listening to this program and you want to be a part of this program, I'm going to tell you how to... Uh, to uh, be a part of this program in just a moment. But first, let me t give you a little bit of uh, idea of what we're going to be talking about uh, this afternoon. Today, this and this is Sunday, um, December the 10th, we're going to be discussing the greatest story seldom ever told. Now, you may hear folks talk, see signs that say the reason for the season and the greatest story ever told, talking about Jesus' birth, but birth, and I'm going to tell you that we're going to be talking about the greatest story that is seldom ever told. And, you know, story, great stories are passed down from generation to generation. That's really what makes them great. Um, I remember hearing kid, uh, stories when I was a kid uh, growing up. My my granddad, he was, he was 80 years old when I was born, and uh, he would always tell stories about Walter and Walter and the mountain lion. And I I can barely remember anything about it. I just remember Walter and the mountain lion. And it seemed like the story kind of changed uh, as he got older and as we got older. And I tried to get my sisters and cousins to write down the story that as they knew it, uh, just so we could have it, you know, preserved for posterity, just for something from our, our grandfather would tell us. But uh, it was a great story, and I think if you ask any of my, my, my cousins, you know, do they remember this story about Walter and the mountain lion, they'd say, oh, yeah, I remember that. But there's a greater story, a greater story that that people, I believe, seldom uh, get to hear, and that's what we're going to be talking about, since most people are thinking about Christmas time, and they they think about the birth of Christ, and so we're going to be talking about the greatest story that's seldom, if ever, uh, told. It's what we're going to be discussing today. If you'd like to be a part of the program, here's how you can reach us. 336 is the area code. 336-427-9696. That's 427-WMYN or 627-9563. 627-WLOE. And if you want to be a part of the program, just call and we'll take your phone calls. It's a live program. And so... Um, uh, uh, we hope that you will will participate in that. Okay, I'm getting some feedback on the on the sound. It says it's pretty weak, but it may be the connection that they're having. Uh, if anybody else is having problems, just call in, and let us know, or whatever. We'll see what we can do. It may it's probably not on our end. It's probably on your end, but in the event that it is on our end, we want to do something about that. But anyway, so three three six four two seven nine six nine six or six two seven nine five six three. Is how you can reach us. So we're going to be talking about the greatest story ever told, but let me remind you of, of my content information. If you want to reach me, friends, a, a word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. That's my email address. My phone number is 276-340-2653. You can call that anytime, you know, off the air and, and get in touch with me or send me a text or, or whatever, and I'll be glad to discuss with you. Uh, and that's how you can reach me. Uh, I try to be accessible to you. If you want to have a Bible study, be glad to come out to your home, sit across the table from you, and open the Bible up, and let's see what God has to say to us from, from uh, His Word. So we hope that you will take advantage of that. So anyway, the greatest story that's seldom ever told. Uh, you know, the, the usual version of the greatest story ever told is is about the birth of Christ, and it indeed is a, a great story. I had to use the word story sometimes because that sounds like something that's kind of made up, but for the sake of our discussion today, we'll, we'll call it a story. You know, and usually great stories start out with uh, something that kind of catches your eye or catches your interest, and friends, if you've never read the Bible, 
I really encourage you to read the Bible. Uh, read it through and, and realize just how great of a uh, book it really is. You know, it, it starts out with a mystery. Now, I don't know about you, but if you if you pick up a good book, it has to intrigue you. There has to be something that, that hooks you and draws you in. And that's, that's really where the greatest story, that uh, the usual greatest story that's ever told, starts off with. I mean, in Genesis 3 and verse 15, here's the mystery. Uh, Adam and Eve are in the garden right and they they partake of the fruit of the tree of of knowledge of good and evil and they're they're deceived by satan the, the woman is deceived and she gives to adam and they're driven out of the garden here's what god says to to satan and to the woman i will put enmity between thee and the woman he's talking to satan and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, when you first read that, friends, if you never don't know anything else about the Bible, you say, "Well, well, wait a minute. How, how can uh, how can this be? What is this? The seed of woman? That sounds really strange and and mysterious. And so uh, you're, you're wondering what this is. Well, as you go, as you read along, you you read about another part of this mystery, another uh, wrinkle to this mystery unfolds in Jeremiah thirty-one verse twenty-two. The Bible says, the Lord shall create a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Now, friends, there's nothing new about a woman giving birth to a child or, or uh, having a, a man in her womb, encompassing him, surrounding him, having a man inside of her. Uh, uh, I mean, women have, have children all the time. And so Jeremiah's talking about a new thing. I mean, what, what is a, this new thing that, that he's speaking of? God is speaking through Jeremiah. I mean, what's so, what's so uh, new about that? So we've got another wrinkle to this mystery of, of the, a woman's seed. Now she's going to have uh, 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 this new thing in the earth. Well, Isaiah comes along, and Isaiah gives even more light on the subject. In Isaiah 7, verse 4, 14, as you're reading through the, the Bible, the book of the, the usual greatest story ever told, you come to Isaiah 7, verse 14. In Isaiah 7 and verse 14, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now wait a minute, a virgin will conceive and, and bear a son? Now that's indeed a great mystery. How, how is this going to take place? Boy, I mean the intrigue is just, is just building here. This is a good story. Friends, this is a good story. And in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, God is speaking and says, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. How does God, how is God going to have a child? I mean, God is a spirit. John 4 and verse 24. And so how, how is God going to have a son that's born of a woman and uh, uh, a virgin is going to conceive? This is, this is uh, all great, you know, so... You may be reading along and say, well, I love a mystery. Well, this ought to pull you in. This ought to make you say, you know what, I want to hear more about this story as it goes along. Now, as the story unfolds, as the story unfolds, we, we come to Joseph and Mary. So years down the line, Isaiah's prophesied, Jeremiah's prophesied. Um, there's been 400 years of silence between uh, Malachi talking and what uh, what Matthew starts recording. So 400 years of silence, and now all of a sudden the story just comes alive again. And we read about a man named Joseph and Mary and, a, and his wife Mary. And in Matthew 1 verse 18, here's how the story continues. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now, think about this. <clears throat> Th think about this. Here is a man. <clears throat> excuse me. He's got a wife. They haven't consummated the marriage. And all of a sudden, she is with child. And he said, well, why should he believe this? Why should he believe, why should he believe that this was from the, 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 
the Holy Spirit. I mean, listen to what the angel says. Uh, listen to what the angel says in Matthew uh, chapter 1. Uh, Matthew chapter 1. Uh, the, the angel says to Joseph, uh, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and that shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And Joseph, being raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, you say, well, why would Joseph believe this? I mean, let's, let's get a little context here. Let's add a little more drama to the story. In Luke 1 and verse 56, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 56, now, Mary, now Mary is has gone to see her cousin. Mary has gone to see her cousin. Now, Mary has been told that she is going to give birth. If you back up to Luke chapter 1 and verse, let's just begin in verse uh, 28. Uh, and the angel came unto, in unto her, this is Mary, and said, Hail, thou that are highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when he saw him, he was troubled at the saying, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give him unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, his king, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now, so Mary gets this information, gets this news, and she's told that her cousin, her old cousin Elizabeth, is also with child. And the next verse says, this is Luke 1, verse 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For as... Uh, lo, as soon as I, the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be performance of those things which were told her of the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Now, if we come on down, notice Mary is staying with uh, Elizabeth about three months. Verse 56 says, And Mary abode with her about three months. Now, Here's, here's where the drama really comes in. Now you think about this. Joseph is told, your, your wife Mary is with child of the Holy Ghost. Well, Mary's gone. Mary's been gone for three months. Now she comes back into town three months later, and well, what do you know? You know, she's looks like she's expecting. And so Joseph is like, why should I believe this? You know, why, should, why should I believe this? Should I believe this? She's been gone for three months. Uh, she's been been uh, uh, up to uh, uh, about 80 miles away, up into the hill country. And she's, you know, she comes back and now she's telling me that she's with, with child. And all of a sudden, uh, I get this visit from an angel. So I'm, you know, maybe I'm kind of skeptical here. But and nonetheless, so we got a little drama added to the mix here. I mean, here's Mary claiming. I mean, can you imagine? You know, 
Your wife comes comes back. You, you've been apart for three months. Comes back. She says, "You know what? I've got. I'm with child of the Holy Spirit." Okay, sure. Yeah, well, that's a pretty good story, isn't it? I mean, how was Joseph to believe it? Well, he needed some information from God. He needed some information from the angel in order to believe this this story that that Mary is is telling him. But what about us? You know, what about us? Joseph got a, a visit from the angel, and, you know, what do we have? We, we have what's written in the Bible. So I'm, I'm trying to show you, friends, this is, this is a pretty good story. And it may be part of the story you've probably heard before, but I want to put it in context so you realize just how great of a story it really is. And so now, now, like any good story, you have some subplots. Let's back up a little bit to Zacharias. Now, this is Elizabeth's husband. And Zacharias is a, is a priest, and he's been in the temple. He's, he's, been, into, he's been to Jerusalem. He's working in the temple. He, they had to work uh, twice a year in, in the temple. And the Bible says in Luke 1, verses 8 through 9, And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Now, while Zacharias is in the temple, now this is, you know, we're, we're flashing back, uh, you know, six months or so before Mary comes to visit. Zacharias is in the temple, and he sees an angel. Luke 1, verse 11, And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And this is what the, this is what the angel says to him. It says, um, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be a father. The angel of the Lord says, well, you know, Zacharias, um, this is, you don't need to fear. Your prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he, and he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now listen to what Zechariah says, verse 18. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife, well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Now, the angel says, we're well, not going to be able to talk. Well, what do you think happened when Mary got to the house? You know, six months later, now here goes Mary up to see Elizabeth and Zacharias, and, you know, Zacharias is sitting over there. He's really quiet. Mary, Elizabeth, what's wrong with Zacharias? He hasn't said a word all night. Well, he's not going to be saying a word. He's not going to be saying a word for about three more months. You know? Now, can you imagine Mary coming back to tell Joseph, oh, by the way, you think, you don't believe that I'm with child of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost? Well, guess what? My cousin Elizabeth, she's going to have a child as well. And her husband saw an angel, and he can't talk. Boy, now this is a good story. This is, this is a good story. Now, the people waited for Zacharias. This is Luke 1, uh, 121. And they marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he beckoned to them and remained speechless. Now, here is... You know, here's how the uh, uh, the story continues. So he couldn't talk, but here's the thing: people can talk. Zacharias can't talk, but you know the people can talk. The people that were there when he was serving in the temple, uh, surely they they talked to everybody about this man. Zacharias, the priest, he went to the temple. He came back out. And he can't talk. We we think he saw a vision. He 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 can't talk, and. Uh, you know, what, what happened to him? Uh, and so, uh, this is, you know, this is, this is part of the good story. 
And then on top of that, you know, he gets back home, and it's not too long after that, his wife Elizabeth, who is an old woman, I mean, she's well stricken in years, she's got a child. She's with child. You know, what was Elizabeth up to while Zacharias was down there in Jerusalem? And then here's Mary, you know, what's she been up to while, while she's been up with uh, uh, Elizabeth? So she gets back home, Elizabeth gets, uh, excuse me, Mary gets back home. She's got a story to tell Joseph. Um, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they've got a pretty interesting story as well. I mean, can't you just imagine how how the talk is going? I mean, you you talk about, they didn't need Twitter and BuzzFeed and, you know, Facebook and MySpace and Face and whatever, you know, Twittergrams, they, they didn't need all that. Well, I mean, I'm sure it spread like wildfire. This is some strange goings on. This is this is a wild story. And so, uh, the Bible says, in those days after his wife Elizabeth conceived, she hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son, and her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed a great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. So a lot of things are going on. People are talking. And then when John was born, Zechariah starts speaking. Luke 1, verse 65, And fear came on all that dwelt around him, and all these things were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Now, friends, there's some strange goings on. Strange goings on. You know what? Mary may be telling the truth. I mean, if all these, these strange things are happening, you know, all around Judea, Maybe maybe Mary's telling the truth, not to mention the fact that that uh, now Joseph is going to be reassured. There in Matthew 1, verse 20, While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So Joseph is reassured. And the Bible says, Joseph raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, so Jesus, here's Jesus born. Oh, that's a great story. And in Luke 2, verses 5 through 7, Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, this is, this is, this is a great story. You know, the birth of Christ. A lot of drama going on in it, a lot of mystery you know, this a virgin's gonna give have have a son and gonna call his name Emmanuel and he's gonna be the son of David and his cousin, you know, his his cousin's gonna be born and a lot of a lot of strange goings on. I mean that's a great story, isn't it? Now most people would stop there, friends. That that's usually where the story stops. Jesus is born and hallelujah and you know, happy birthday, Jesus. That's what people think this time of the year. And that's the reason I'm telling you this story because there's part of the story that you haven't heard. I don't I don't think that you've really heard, you know, the whole story. What was it Paul Harvey used to say? But now the rest of the story. There there's that's that's a good story. But the greatest story really is very seldom, if ever told. See, the birth of Jesus Christ, friends, you know what it proves? It proves he was born. That's, that's really what it proves. 
How, how do you know that he was born of a virgin? I mean, think about it. Well, the Bible says he's born of a virgin. Well, I know that. But just because he was born doesn't prove that his, he was born of a virgin. You see, just, just the fact that we are coming to the world from our mother's womb, that doesn't prove whether or not we're born of a virgin or not. There has to be something else. See? There has to be the rest of the story that verify, yes, indeed, he was born of a virgin. Yes, indeed, he is the Son of God. Yes, he is the Christ that was promised. Yes, he is that seed that was going to bruise Satan's head. See, there has to be, there has to be more to the story. And so what we just read, it proves that he was born. It, it doesn't prove that he's the Son of God. It doesn't prove that he's the Messiah. That, I mean, there has to be some more proof there. So the greatest story that was ever told is really, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's, it's good. It's really good. But the greatest story, the greatest part of the story is what I'm telling you is seldom, if ever, told. And that's why, that's what we're going to talk about today. So what is the rest of the story? What's the greater story that seldom, if ever, told? That's what we're going to get into discussing. Let me take a break here and let me tell you our phone numbers in case you want to call in and be part of the program. Area code 336-427-9696. That's 427-WMYN. Or area code 336-627-9563. 627-9563. 627-WLOE. We're talking about the greatest story that was ever told or the greatest part of the story that is seldom ever told. And so what is the what is the rest of the story? What is the rest of the story? Friends, I believe when people stop in the middle of the story, they you know, they it's it's like getting up and walking out of the movie before you know, before the final scene. It's like reading a book and you, you stop reading before you read the last chapter. I mean, there's there's a, a greater part of the story that, that if you leave out, you, you miss it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a common um, trend now. A lot of movies, they put teasers and trailers for upcoming movies or sequels after the credits. So if you go watch a movie, if you go watch a movie and you get up when the credits start rolling, you miss it. You know? You you miss the, the trailer, you miss the tease, you miss the you know, the rest of the story, what's coming next part of it. So you you need to sit and watch all the all of the credits roll. So the greatest story they ever told, most people say, Well, it's the birth of Christ. Friends, I'm telling you that's not the greatest story that was ever told. That's a good story. That's a good part of the story. That's an essential part of the story, but that's not the rest of the story. The greatest story that could ever be told, and yet is very seldom told, especially by people in the religious world, is, is, is the real birth of Christ. That's right, the real birth of Christ. You said, well, James, you, you talked about how Christ was born. The real birth of Christ was not when he was born as a babe. So that, that's not the real birth of Christ. And you say, well, what, what do you mean, James? Here's what I mean by this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now you're saying, James, I hear that all the time. I hear, I hear people, people quote 1 Corinthians 15. That's right. But here's my point. Do you hear them explain it as the birth of Christ? 
Most people don't put that as the birth of Christ. They say, well, it's the death, birth, and resurrection of Christ and go on about it. Friends, that's like picking up the uh, up the book and reading the last chapter and going, see, here, here's, here's all the story. No. The first part of the story is incomplete without the last part, and the last part is just as incomplete without the first part. When Paul said to preach the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he's telling us the rest of the story, the greatest story that is seldom ever told. Do you think about, do you think about what the prophets were saying? The prophets weren't just talking about Christ is going to come into the world. Friends, the whole point of Christ coming into the world was not so we can give gifts on a particular day that, by the way, we can't even prove is Christ's birthday. That wasn't the reason why Christ came into the world. He didn't come into the world so we can have a holiday, so you can get off work. That's not why he came into the world. Jesus didn't come into the world so that, you know, you can uh, uh, decorate your house or whatever. That's not why he came into the world. Listen to this. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 8 says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. The reason why Christ came into the world was to die for our sins. And so it's true if he wasn't if he wasn't born into the world, he couldn't have died for us. But the most important part of the story is that he died for our sins. Alright? Now, I say the most important part that he died for our sins. It was, it was essential that a just man, a perfect man, die for the sin of the world. And that's why Jesus said, Jesus said, I came into this world to, uh, to seek and save the lost. Uh, uh, I, he came to give his life a, a, a ransom, right, for, for many. Uh, so 1 Timothy 2 and verse 6 says, who gave himself for a ransom for all. And so when you talk about, well, Christ came into the world, yeah, he came into the world, and he came into the world to die. But his death is not even the rest of the story. I mean, that's just a part of the story. But the reason why he died, that's, that's part of the great story too. That most people don't connect with his, his birth. Most people this time of the year, they're all... <clears throat> they're just singing away in a manger and they've got Jesus and Joseph and Mary sitting outside in the cold with, you know, look like three guys in a beard. I don't know if it's, you know, one guy said, what's that ZZ Top at a Farm Aid concert? You know, I don't know who, the, who these guys are. They have things decorated in the yard. Happy birthday, Jesus. Where did you get that? But what the Bible is telling us is, look, the birth of Jesus coming to the world, that's just part of it. He died for our sins. Now listen to what Paul went, on, went ahead and said. He went on to say that he was buried. He was buried. Isaiah 53 and verse 9. <clears throat> the same prophet that prophesied Jesus would be born of a virgin says this. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So the prophet prophesied what kind of burial he would have. He would, he would be buried with the rich. And sure enough, in Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60, when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he took the body of Christ and he laid it in his own tomb, new tomb which he had hewn out in the rock and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. So the death and the burial of Christ is a key part of the story. But that he rose again. He rose again. Uh, Psalm 16 and verse 10 
For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see, the corrupt, see corruption. See, the prophets prophesied that Jesus wouldn't stay in the grave. Now, isn't that, isn't that more of an exciting story than someone's going to be born? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not downplaying or trying to de-emphasize the birth of Christ. But I'm just saying people get all excited about baby Jesus, baby Jesus, baby Jesus. Well, what about Jesus being born to die for our sins, be buried according to the scriptures? That is, when he was buried, he, was, he fulfilled all the scriptures about his burial, including where he would be buried, buried with the rich. He fulfilled that. And then the fact that the scriptures actually prophesied that he was going to be uh, in the grave such a short period of time that he wouldn't even start decaying. He wouldn't see corruption. That's what the psalmist said. Acts 13 to verse 28. And they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher, but God raised him from the dead. Now see, friends, here's my point. You, you just stop with baby Jesus, and you miss you miss the, the rest of the story. You miss him being born from the grave. That's right, I said born from the grave. Because this has everything to do with the birth of Christ. The most important part of the birth of Christ is not is not that he how he was brought into this world. No, that, that's that's an important part of it. It was important that he fulfilled all those prophecies about being born of a virgin and where he would be born in Bethlehem. That he'd be the son of David. I mean all all those are, are important. But here's what the death, burial, and resurrection has to do with the birth of Christ. In Acts 13, verse 32 and 33, the Bible says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee? Here's, here's my point, folks. When people, this time of the year, especially, when they go on and on and on about baby Jesus, baby Jesus, baby Jesus, and they've got a baby out here and a bunch of hay and, and everything, they're missing the point. For Jesus to come into the world, like we said earlier, for Jesus to come into the world, being born of a woman, only proved that he came into the world. <laughs> That's all that proved. But what proves that he was born of a virgin, that he fulfilled the prophecy about being born of a virgin, what proves that he fulfilled all the prophecies about where he'd be born and, and how he'd be born, and that he'd be called a a, a, a Nazarene and that he would be despised because he lived in a, in a certain place like Nazareth. All the things that he fulfilled in, in his uh, birth are verified only, only if he ra was raised from the dead. Now stop and think about that. If Jesus died, that didn't prove anything, but he died. Everybody dies. I mean, think about this story. Think about the story if Jesus just comes into the world and dies. There's a man. He is born. His mother's name was Mary. His father's name was Joseph. His father was a carpenter. This man lived uh, about 33 years. He went around Galilee. He did some miracles, and he hung on the tree, and they buried him. The end. What does that prove? It doesn't prove anything. I mean, how many people have been born into this world and they lived and they died? But it is the resurrection of Christ from the dead 
that declares that Jesus is indeed the man that was promised way back in Genesis 3.15 when God told Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I mean, the birth of Christ is, 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 a, is a great part of the story. But if Christ is not raised from the dead, I mean, he's just another man. He's just another man. In Romans 1 verse 4, listen to what, what, what Paul says. Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Now you might say, well, James, I, I believe, I remember God saying that Jesus was his son in Matthew chapter in Matthew chapter 3 uh, when, he was, uh, when he was baptized and he came up out of the water. There was a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Yeah, that's true. But Christ still had a whole lot of temptations to go through. He had, he had some life to live yet. And if at any time he sinned and disobeyed God, guess what? He's not coming out of that grave. And that's why Paul says, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. If Christ wasn't holy, if he wasn't righteous, if he didn't fulfill all of God's uh, plan for man's redemption, he's not coming out of that grave. If he, if, if he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin, is what the Hebrew writer says. But if he had sinned, guess what? He's not coming out of that grave because he's just like you and me. He's like anybody else. And so my whole point is this. The resurrection of Christ from the dead is what makes the birth of Christ, the physical birth of Christ, have any kind of credibility or any kind of, of importance. I mean, it verifies who he was. It tells us what kind of man he was. It tells us that he, he fulfilled these prophets, prophecies. And that's why it's important for us to understand the rest of the story. I mean, the greatest story ever told is not the birth of Christ. Not the physical birth of Christ. The greatest story ever told is, is the account that tells us he was raised from the dead. Because that's what gives us the most hope. People say, well, you know, the angel said peace on earth and, you know, love and joy and peace all come because Christ came into the world. Well, in, in a way that's true. But it didn't come into the world because he was born into this world. It came into the, it came into the world through him because he was raised from the dead. Again, where's the joy, where's the hope, where's the peace? if Christ doesn't raise from the dead. I mean, uh, listen to what Paul says. Paul is going to tell us uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Listen how Paul emphasizes the resurrection of Christ. Now we've just we started in chapter 15 talking about the death and resurrection of Christ. But notice what he says. He said, Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is, is vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised up not if the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. For then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life also only we have hope in Christ, we 
are of all men most miserable. Everything hinges upon the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. <coughs> the resurrection of Christ is what's so important. I mean, that's, that's the most important part of the story. Because like I said, anybody can tell a story they were born. Anybody can tell a story about a man that was born, that lived and died. But can you tell a story about a man that lived, born, lived and died, and was raised again by the power of God, never to die again? Who died on the cross for the sins of the world? No, you can't say that. So Christ became the firstborn from the dead. In Colossians 1 verse 18, Paul said, He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I mean, think about that. He's the first one from the dead. First person to be raised from the dead, never to die again. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, But now is Christ raised from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The greatest story ever told? It doesn't, it doesn't stop with baby Jesus. It, 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 you know, that's just a starting point, really. That's just, or halfway through the book. The greatest story ever told has to include the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And I'm saying, friends, that's why it's the, mo it's the story, the greatest story that's seldom ever told. All right? The greatest story that's seldom ever told because most people don't connect the importance of the resurrection of Christ from the dead to his birth. I mean, you can celebrate, I mean, people celebrate birthdays all the time. People celebrate birthdays. How many times have you been around the sun? That's really what they're saying. How many times have you been around the sun? Oh, that, that's a great feat. That's a great accomplishment. You, you, you've been on the earth and you've circled the globe. You've circled the sun. How many times? <clears throat> have you ever come out of the grave? I mean, isn't that a greater story? But listen. Jesus being born is not what gives hope. Being born from the dead is what gives hope. And so instead of saying the virgin birth is what proves his, his life was divine, you know, that he was, he was God's son, you ought to say his divine, holy, faithful life is what makes it credible and necessary to say that he was the son of God. And thus, he had a supernatural birth. He had a, he had a birth that was like no other because he fulfilled all the prophecies that was spoken about the Messiah. See? And just what I'm saying, friends, the greatest story seldom ever told is he leaves out the, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They don't tie it together. And then what they don't what they don't tell, <clears throat> excuse me, is they don't tell the rest of that story. I mean, they, it's like they, it's like most people will tell the story in three different three different stories, and they don't tell the rest of the rest of the story. Well, they'll tell the first part over here, you know, in December. They'll tell the first part Jesus was born of a virgin, and everybody celebrates that. Then you might hear the preacher talk about, oh, yeah, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and they talk about that. They don't put them together. They don't put together how important one is to the other. And then there's another part. There's another part that they don't leave out either, that they leave out too. And I'm going to tell you about that in the time I have remaining. But I want to give you our phone numbers in case you want to call in, have some questions or comments about what we've said so far. 336-427-9696. That's 427-9696. WMYN or 627-9563, 627-WLOE is how you can be a part of the program. <clears throat> so what is the rest of the rest of the story? Friends, when Jesus was raised from the grave, the story didn't stop there. That, that's not where the story ended. That's not where the story ended. Notice this. In Acts chapter 1, in Acts chapter 1, <clears throat> excuse me, Luke is telling us what Jesus did 
for 40 days, for 40 days after his resurrection, here's what Jesus did. The former treatise have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, being by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So for forty days, what was Jesus doing? He was talking about the kingdom. He was talking about the kingdom of God. Now friends, if you've only got forty days before you ascend up to heaven, don't you want to talk about the most important things? I mean, wouldn't you spend your time taking care of business? I mean, how many times do people say, well, you know, if I, if I knew when I was going to die, boy, you know what they'd do. They would set their house in order. They would get their ducks in a row. Forty days Jesus had between the time that he was raised and the time that he was going to be ascended into heaven. And he talked about things pertaining to the kingdom. Now, friends, here's the rest of the rest of the story. Jesus was preparing his disciples for a kingdom that was going to come. It was going to come with power. It was going to come with power. In Luke, in Luke uh, 24, I want you to notice what Jesus said. <clears throat> Luke 24, and verse, let's start in verse uh, uh, 45. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, and he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among the nation, all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. <coughs> Excuse me. Ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power on high. Now, that power was going to be the... Uh, was, was going to be the uh, indication that the kingdom was going to come. How to know that? In Matthew 9, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some that stand here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. In Acts 2, the power of the Holy Spirit descended and sat upon the apostles uh, and uh, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and set up on each of them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The beginning of the church started in Acts chapter 2. The kingdom started. And this is what Jesus spent his last 40 days talking about. The rest of the rest of the story, the rest of the rest of the greatest story that is, has ever been told, seldom ever told, and s seldom if ever, almost never told, has to do with the kingdom. It ends with the kingdom of God. It ends with the kingdom that Christ set up. And on the day of Pentecost, the individuals who heard the preaching of Peter and the other 11 were told about the kingdom that Christ was going to establish. Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church, Matthew 16, verse 18, when he was preparing them in his ministry. And then he started talking about the kingdom, which was the church. And in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, the, the church, well, the people were added to the church. They were added to the kingdom. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, Acts 2 verse 47. When the people on the day of Pentecost heard Peter, Peter and the other 11 preaching and were convinced that they had killed the, the Christ, but that that same Christ they had crucified was now raised up, he had fulfilled all the prophecies that were that were uh, spoken about him, thus verifying that he was the Son of God, proving that he was the Son of God, and now he's ascended on the right, sitting on the right hand of God. They said, "Men and brethren, what shall we do?" And Peter, and the, Peter, answered them and said, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins." And they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about three thousand souls. Acts 2, verse 41, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They were added to the kingdom. Friends, no one talks about the kingdom. Not in connection with the resurrection of Christ and certainly not connected with him being born of a virgin. It's almost like they're 
three different stories, and no one ever talks about the, the kingdom part because they tell you the church is not important. See how that is? I know your preacher doesn't talk about the kingdom, the importance of the kingdom, because he, want he wants to tell you the church is not important. He's looking for a kingdom to be set up over here in Jerusalem somewhere. That's never going to happen. Jesus established his kingdom. Paul said we're translated to the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1 verse 13. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. And if you, can, if you uh, become a member of the Lord's church, the church of Christ, guess what? You're in the kingdom. And that is the rest of the story. That's the rest of the rest of the story. And the good news is, friends, you can be born the same way and raised the same, by the same power of Christ. In John 3, verse 5, Jesus said, answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Oh, you want to enter into the kingdom of God? Well, you should. Jesus spent 40 days talking about it. The last thing he talked about was the kingdom of God. How do you do that? Born of the, born of the water and the Spirit, Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. The same power that raised Christ from the grave is the same power that will raise you and me <clears throat> from the watery grave of baptism when we're obedient to the gospel, remove our sins with a circumcision made without hands through faith in the operation of God, that is, we have faith that God's going to do his part if we are obedient to him. It's the same power that forgives sins that raised Christ from the dead. How do I know that? <clears throat> you remember in Mark chapter 2, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus tells a man that is uh, sick of the palsy. He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. And everybody said, well, no one can forgive sins but God. And Jesus said, which is easier to say? Thy sins be forgiven thee or arise, take up thy bed and walk? Which is easier to do? I can't do either one of them. But God can. And you want friends, which is easier to do? Raise someone from the dead or to forgive sins? I can't do either one of them, but God can. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power, is the same power that forgives your sins if you're obedient to God and you become a member of the body of Christ or the, or the kingdom, which is what Christ talked about. So what's the story? The greatest story that is seldom, if ever, told is the connection between the birth of Christ, the physical birth of Christ, and the birth of him from the dead, raised from the dead, that verified he indeed was the Son of God. And then the kingdom that he established for all individuals who will be obedient to him, how they can be, become a child of God and be faithful unto him. The saved are added to the church. And friends, the church of Christ is the only one you read about in the Bible. Now the greatest story that no one will tell you, except members of the church of Christ, is about the church of Christ. We're the, we're the ones that are on the radio, on the TV. We're the ones having to open the phone lines up, saying, ask your preacher, ask your pastor these questions. They won't answer them. But we will. You know why? Because we know the rest of the story. We read the book. We know how it ends. And you know what, friends? I'll tell you how the book ends. In Ephesians 5, verse 23, Christ is the Savior of the body, and the body's the church. So if you want to be if you want to be a part of the saved, you got to be part of the church, the church of Christ. Friends, I can't do any better than that. I'm telling you the whole story. Friends, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to tell you if we can if we can assist you in any way, want you to do that very thing. You can reach me at 276-340-2653, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. Come visit the 250 Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina, and God willing, next week we'll we have some more to say about Christmas. So tune in next week. Right here at five o'clock on on uh, five o'clock on WMYN. Have a good night.